I think it provides access to a corpus of data and a suite of services that are not well integrated into a search or chat interface anywhere today. So, you know, knowing what restaurants have what seats available is in a closed service. It's in a, it's in a data warehouse operated by OpenTable. And now what OpenTable can do is provide an API into that data via an interface and they can allow ChatGPT to make a request to figure that data out to give a response to a user where they can ultimately benefit from transacting and allowing a service. This closes the loop between search and commerce in a way that Google cannot and does not do today. And I think that's what makes it very powerful. We've seen this attempted in a number of important ways in the last couple of years with Alexa and Apple Home and, and Google Home kind of integration via the chat services that they offer, you know, where you speak to the device. But the deep integration that's possible now and the natural language way that you can go from the request all the way through to the transaction is what makes this so extremely powerful. And I think, you know, the points I made a few weeks ago when we first talked about, you know, search, having so many searches that are done where the human computer interface presents a table or presents a chart or presents a shopping list in a matrix, that's what makes search such a defensible product, I think could theoretically be completely obviated or destroyed with an interface like this, where you can write the ability for chat GPT or whatever the, the, the core centralized services to actually present results in a table, in a matrix, in an interface, in a shopping list, and actually close the transaction loop. It's really disruptive to things like commerce providers. It's really disruptive, you know, some of these commerce platforms, it's really disruptive to a lot of different industries, but also introduces a lot of real opportunity to build on top of that capability and that functionality to rewrite and ultimately make things easier and better for consumers on the internet. What do you think, Chamath, you're looking at this and it seems to be moving at a very fast pace, over 100 million users. They put a business model on it already, 20 bucks a month. They have a secondary business model of, hey, use the API and, and we'll charge you for usage. And then you layer on what Zapier and if this then that had already sort of established in the world which is APIs, but nobody ever really wanted to write scripts. So that seemed to be the blocker. You go into Zapier, if this and that, it's for 5% of the audience, people who want to customize stuff, people who want to tinker. But this seems to now with the chat GPT chat interface, open it up to a lot of people. So is this super significant? Or is this a commodity product that, you know, 10 people will have, uh, if we're sitting here next year on all in episode 220? I think you are asking the exact right question. And you use the a great term, like in poker, if there are three hearts on the board and you have the ace of hearts, you have what's called the nut blocker, right? Which means that nobody else, even if anybody else has a flush, they never have the best flush. And if flush is the best hand, there's a lot of ways that you can manipulate the pot and eventually win the pot because you have that ace of hearts and nobody else has it. The concept of blocker I think is very important to understand here, which is what are the real blockers for this capability to not be broadly available? So I think you have to segregate. You have the end user destination, you have the language model, and then you have the third party services. And so if you ask the question, what is the incentive of the third party service? Well, the shareholders of a travel site, right? They're not interested in doing an exclusive deal with any distribution endpoint. They want their services integrated as broadly as possible, right? So I think the, the answer for the service providers is just like they build an app for iOS and for Google. And, you know, if they could have justified it, they would have built an app for a gaming console. They can, the they Windows should, phone. they would, they do, yeah. right? So that's going to get commoditized and broadly available. I think on the LLM side, I think we've talked about this everybody's converging on each other. In fact, there was an interesting article that was released that said that there was a handful of Google engineers that quit because apparently Bard was actually learning on top of ChatGPT, which they felt was either Cheating? illegal or unethical or something, right? So, so the point is, I think we've talked about this for a while, but all of these models will converge in the absence of 
highly unique data, right? What I've been calling these white truffles. So if you can hoard white truffles, your model will be better. Otherwise, your model will be the same as everybody else's model. And then you have the distribution endpoints of which there are many whose economic incentives are very high, right? So Facebook doesn't want to just sit around and have all this traffic go to chat GPT. They want to be able to enable Instagram users and WhatsApp users and Facebook users to interact through Messenger or what have you. Obviously, Google has a, you know, many hundreds of billions of reasons to defend their territory. So I think all of this to me just means that these are really important use cases. As an investor, I think it's important to just stay a little patient. Because it's not clear to me that there are any natural blockers. But I do think that David's right that it's demonstrating a use case that's important. But it's still so early. We are six weeks in. Yeah, I tell you, I think there's a couple of great blockers here where there's going to be an M&A bonanza for Silicon Valley. If you look at certain data sets, Reddit, Stack Overflow for programming, and Quora, these things are going to be worth a fortune. And to be able to buy those or get exclusive licenses to those, if you're Maybe. Google Bard or if you're ChatGPT, that could be a major difference maker, Twitter's data set, obviously. And then you look at certain tools like Zapier and if this and that, they've spent a decade building the sort of, you know, meta API. That would be an incredible blocker. I, I think this is going to be like a balkanization I, of I'll be honest so many you, oil I'm, sources. Zapier already and, did it for free. They did a plugin yeah, for free. Exactly. That, yeah, I was just going to say, I don't think these are not blockers. I don't think this is the ace of hearts uh, on a flush board. I don't think so. I think that these things are really interesting assets. They are definitely truffly in nature. But they may not be the, you know, 10 pound white truffle from yeah, Aldo that we're looking for. Yeah, no, yeah. but on the M&A side, don't you think this would be like incredible? No, but the only reason I say that again is it is just so early. Like I in the text, I, I mentioned this to you guys. I remember and Sachs and I were in the middle of this. We were both right at the beginning of social networking. Sachs started Genie. I was in the middle of AIM. And all of a sudden we saw Reed start social net. Then we saw Friendster get started. Then we saw MySpace get started. And you have to remember, when you look back now, 20 years later, the winner was the seventh company, which was Facebook, not the first, not the second. It was the seventh, which started two and a half years properly after the entire Web.20 phenomenon started. Yeah. Same with search, by the way, where Google was probably 20 exactly. to the, to the yep. scene. Yeah, Excite, Lycos. If you want to yeah. be a real student of business history, I'll just say something that's more meta, which is... If there's something that I've learned on the heels of this SVB fiasco is that there is an enormous amount of negative perception of Silicon Valley and frankly, a lot of disdain for VCs and prognosticating technologists, right? And I think that- So you have mean to this be, podcast? I think <laughs> we have to be very careful. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and I, I do think that we are an example of that because we are the bright, shiny object of the people that were successful. And the broad- makeup of America thinks that we're not nearly as smart as we all think we are. And after all of this money that's been burned in crypto land and NFTs and all of this Web3 nonsense, to yet again whip up the next hype cycle, I think doesn't serve us well. So I do think there's something very important here. But I think if we want to maintain reputational capital through this cycle, because government will get involved much faster in this cycle. I think it's important to just be methodical and thoughtful, iterate, experiment, but it's too early to call it, I guess is what I would say.